Okay, so first I will test this. Does it sound like it's on? It's just the recording. Oh, it's just the recording. Okay, so I will, I will shout um, because I have a, uh, I know I have a soft voice. If you folks in the back can't hear me, um, you know, raise your hand or do something so that I can um, try and project more. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Natalie and Ginny, for the invitation. Um, to speak today and thank all of you guys for coming out in the rain. Uh, I drove up this morning, or I actually drove over from Friday Harbor, and uh, it's wet. So thank you for coming, <laughs> gotta say. <laughs> I'm a little tired of that, but that's okay. Um, uh, I took a look at some of the other speakers in this series, and, and um, one that, uh, there are a number of other really interesting speakers coming, and uh, among them is uh, Nancy Turner, and I would give a big shout out uh, for those of you that might be able to attend her talk, she's a very interesting um, woman with great stories to tell. Okay, I am going to talk about ocean acidification today. Uh, and I um, am assuming that there are only a handful of seawater chemists in the room. <laughs> okay, and if that's not a fair assumption, please let me know or please bear with me. Um, and if I really make any blunders, or if you really need clarifications on things I might say, Brooke Love is right here, <laughs> and she can answer your questions. Okay, so let's get started. Um, I want to kind of approach this in two ways. I want to give you a snapshot, and it's just a snapshot of what we know. Ocean acidification is a big issue. There is a lot of research uh, being devoted to the issue, both here in Washington State, along the entire West Coast, and around the world. And we're gaining knowledge really, really quickly. So I can't do justice to all of ocean acidification. I can't even do justice to all of ocean acidification in the Salish Sea. So I'm going to give you um, a feel for it. And then I'm going to move on and, and um, to try and address the question, so what, or what can we do about it? Okay, so let's start this way. What do we know? And again, this is just some of what we know, and I've tried to um, capture some of the most recent work. So we know that ocean acidification, which uh, results from <coughs> the absorption of CO2 from the atmosphere into the ocean, causes a suite of changes in seawater chemistry. Okay, there are a number of changes that are caused, but among those, and the ones I'm going to talk about today, are that the partial pressure of CO2 increases. So don't worry about the partial pressure part, it's just that CO2 from the atmosphere, about 30% of it, that's an approximation, ends up in the ocean. So as we add more CO2 to the atmosphere, we get more CO2 in the ocean. Okay. Got that. Associ when that CO2 dissolves in the ocean, it changes the buffering system. And don't worry too much about the buffering system, but the point you want to remember is that the pH declines. And remember that pH is on a log scale, kind of like earthquakes, or actually just like earthquakes. Um, so a small, even a small change in pH is really a big change, or it can be a big change. So CO2 in seawater increases from the atmosphere into the water. The pH goes down. Um, and the aragonite saturation state declines. OK, aragonite saturation state is simply a measure. It's an indicator of how easy or difficult it is to precipitate calcium carbonate and make shells or skeletons, OK? So as aragonite saturation state goes down, and sometimes we use the shorthand omega for that, it's harder and harder or more energetically costly for organisms to build their shells. OK, these are among the changes that happen. There's also changes in things like carbonate ion and other associated changes that we're not going to talk about much today. But keep these three terms in mind, OK? Okay, <clears throat> what we know is that the rate of change 
in the global ocean pH is unprecedented in the last 25 million years. And you can go even further back than that, and it still looks gloomy. Um, but if we just look in the last 25 million years, which is actually relatively recent on you know, a geologic time scale, you can see that since the Industrial Revolution in about 1800, seawater pH has dropped precipitously. It's dropped like a rock, and it will continue to do so. Okay? And I, I think this is the most sobering plot of the day. We also know that low, low pH and aragonite saturation state in the Salish Sea will become more frequent. <coughs> so I've tried to um, use examples and use data that were collected in the Salish Sea. And because of that, s some of the graphs are a little bit more complicated than I might have liked, but let me explain this to you. So this is not a plot of um, pH or aragonite saturation state itself. It's a plot of pH here and two different values of aragonite saturation state. And what's on the y-axis here is the percent of the year or the number of days that those values become critically low. Okay? So we know that um, for pH, a pH of 7.69 is actually very low anyway. Um, the pH of the world ocean before the just before or at the dawn of the Industrial Revolution was about 8.1. So 7.69 is already pretty low. But the number of days here where it becomes critically low will increase in the future. And it's the same thing for aragonite. So an aragonite of 1.0 is kind of really just barely good enough for most shell building organisms to maybe build shells. That's, that's considered to be a critical threshold. Um, and if you're below 1.0, you're not building shells very easily. <coughs> Maybe not at all. Um, a, an aragonite saturation state of 1.7 is better. Okay? Th so this is, this is actually a good place to be. This is mm, not so good, but not absolutely terrible. And you can see that both of them are declining, um, which means that the percent of the year, or the number of days each year, where the seawater chemistry is unfavorable <laughs> to shell building organisms, is going to decline um, as we move into the next century. OK? Uh, and as I go, let me go back and say, this plot and the next plot I'm going to show, those are from the Northern Salish Sea, from the area around the Hakai Institute up in the Strait of Georgia, um, Wiley Evans work. So we know also that temporal variation, so variation over time in both pH and aragonite saturation are really substantial. So you can see, I mean, this is an enormous amount of variation. Let's look at pH. Um, pH varies from about 7.8 up to, you know, above 8.2. Okay, 8.2 is a great value. Um, 7.8 is not so good, um, but it varies over time. So here's January and July, so values are low in the winter. They tend to be higher in the summer, low again in the winter, higher in the summer. Um, the difference between the red and the black lines is that they come from different instruments. Um, but they show they're very consistent in what they're measuring. And then we look at aragonite saturation state. And again, there's in winter, aragonite saturation state is below one. Um, often uh, it rises to really sort of very uh, sufficient levels of you know, up to three and sometimes four um, in the summer. And then it goes back down again in the winter in the Sailor Sea. Um, so the variation is large. A s uh, spatial variation is also really substantial. So 
let me explain this. This uh, comes from work by Jan Newton and some of her colleagues. These are cruise data. So these are samples taken on cruises. And the cruise track goes from about Admiralty Inlet out towards La Push. And what you can see is that um, this is, I, I just chose one track from September, but they all look about the same. Um, in uh, September, the values of um, aragonite saturation state are lower in the inland waters, and they get generally a little bit higher or a little more favorable as you go out towards the coast. And this is a pattern that we see. Um, and I'll probably come back to this a couple different times. The conditions in the Salish Sea tend to be, tend to be more severe than those on the outer coast, the waters of the outer coast. Um, so, and, and that's shown really nicely here. So you have lower aragonite saturation state inside compared with outside. You can also see a difference between <coughs> surface water, which is a, within about a meter of the surface, and bottom water. So these plots on the right-hand side that are virtually all red or orange were taken at depth. <coughs> Aragonite saturation state tends to be lower at depth than at the surface, at least in our waters in the Salish Sea area. So you've got spatial variation going from like east to west, and then you've got spatial variation going from top to bottom. And that's all superimposed on, on what we saw in the last slide, <laughs> that we've got temporal variation going from winter to summer. OK, so just to sort of recap that bit, in the Salish Sea, what you want to remember is that the pH and the aragonite saturation state, that's the shell building part of this, <coughs> are often low and in fact often quite low, and they're projected to continue to decline. Conditions vary over space and time, and the changes we see in the Salish Sea are consistent with those along the West Coast, and in fact, um, pretty much globally, but often the conditions here are more severe. OK. We might be mostly done with chemistry. Um, so I'm an ecologist, and um, so I tend to talk about the biological effects. Uh, and, and really, I think for most people, it's the biological effects that um, tend to be more compelling. Um, not because chemistry is unimportant. Chemistry is the basis of this. But most people sort of connect with the environment through organisms, either by watching them or studying them or eating them. Right? So let's think about uh, what's going on with the organisms. There's been a number of studies done, and this is just one example. <coughs> and this is West Coast wide. This is not restricted to the Salish Sea. Um, but we know with absolute consistency and with great certainty that the biological effects of ocean acidification occur across critical life processes multiple trophic levels, and multiple habitats. So let me walk you through this. This is a figure from Christy Croker, um, <coughs> but there are other people that have done similar sorts of analyses. Um, on the y-axis here, we have the mean effect size. Anything above this dotted line of zero means it's a positive response to high CO2 or low pH. And anything below the dotted line means it's a negative response. And what you can see is that there are more negative responses than positive responses by quite a lot. So survival in lots of different organisms um, is compromised. There's, in fact, a lot of mortality associated with um, low pH and high CO2. Calcification in those shell building organisms um, declines growth declines. Um, photosynthesis doesn't show much of an effect, positive or negative. Uh, development, though, shows a negative response. And abundance, meaning the number of organisms, shows a negative response. Metabolism shows 
kind of, you know, there's a lot of variation around this. Metabolism in some cases actually goes up a little bit because there are energetic costs to dealing with this, and that causes metabolism to rise some in, in some cases. Okay, so there's a fair amount of red on that plot. Um, we know that the, the sort of frequency of negative responses increases with the severity of the conditions. So let me walk you through this. This is from a completely different group of researchers. And again, it's not restricted to the Salish Sea, but it includes organisms from the Salish Sea. Um, so essentially, positive effects are green. No effects are yellow and or neutral effects. And negative effects are red. And what you can see for four important groups of organisms, so echinoderms, those would be sea stars and urchins um, and cucumbers, if you like sea cucumbers, um, mollusks, so clams, oysters, um, abalone, uh, crustaceans, crabs and their relatives, uh, and then fishes, we can see that there's a lot of red on that plot. There's a lot of negative effect. And you can see that those negative effects increase <coughs> with the amount of CO2 in the water. Right now, OK, these are laboratory studies. And so some of the values on these plots are unrealistic. They're values that we don't find in the world ocean today. Um, you can imagine that we might be in this range and these two bars. Look at the second and third, I mean the third and fourth bars is kind of where we're at in the Sailor Sea. And you can see that for lots of, um, for actually for all of these taxa, they are <coughs> negatively affected by conditions that we are likely to see here already. Okay? And as you continue to put more CO2 in the water, they will continue to show more serious or more frequent responses. Yeah? Just out of curiosity, what are the values on the top x-axis of the ground representing? Uh, numbers of studies. Okay. Thanks for pointing that out. So this is a big analysis of um, many different studies done by many different investigators. OK. We also know that the intrinsic sensitivity varies by taxon or by species, um, by species group. This is um, a plot that was done by Jennifer Sunday. Um, it hasn't yet been published. Uh, she's still working on the paper. Um, and it reflects West Coast species only. So not restricted to the Salish Sea, but including species here. Um, that are common along the West Coast. And what you can see is that seagrass tends to show a, you know, a moderately positive response to increasing CO2, um, as do, this is the weird one, as in this case, the ochre stars, which is um, Pisaster ochraceus. It's the ochre colored sea star that you see around here, or used to see around here more often. Um, this is actually not well substantiated, this particular point. And so I'm, you know, kind of hold that a little bit aside. Uh, these other values here that are on the negative side are better substantiated. And you can see that um, among them, red urchins, pink salmon, Dungeness crab, rockfish, um, and uh, copper and quillback rockfish and blue and black rockfish, they're kind of separate subgroups, um, all show s negative sensitivities to increasing CO2. Okay, so lots of organisms are sensitive. Okay, this is a little bit of a busy slide. I'm trying to um, capture a lot in this slide. Uh, so briefly, what, what, what I want to say here is that um, in 
many different groups, and especially those that build shells, those calcifying species, negative, there are no negative effects and that um, impact calcification, so the ability to build a shell and maintain that shell. So not only do you have to build a shell, you have to keep that shell, right? You have to keep it from dissolving. And those are actually two different processes in, um, in shell, building, shell building organisms. <coughs> Um, and then there are changes in energetics, and it turns out that especially for larval phases, they often simply don't have the energy to build their shell or maintain their shell when they're really tiny, under uh, low pH and high CO2 conditions. So it, in many cases, boils down to the m energy that's required to sort of meet your metabolic demands as to whether or not you can um, tolerate ocean acidification conditions or not. So what we know from mussels up there on the left, upper left, is that um, the shells are smaller and thinner. The shells of the adults are smaller and thinner under ocean acidification conditions. The shells of the, the larvae have a harder time building their shells and then even these byssus threads here that the, that the um, muscles use to attach themselves to rocks, and those byssus threads are made of protein, not calcium carbonate, even those are um, less effective. They're, they lose strength, they produce fewer of them, and those um, threads are not as strong under ocean acidification conditions. Um, if you move over to the right, that's an oyster. That's a Pacific oyster. That's the kind people like to eat, mostly. And there is an enormous amount of literature on oysters. Turns out that they have a very hard time building and maintaining shells in the larval phase, the really tiny phase. And that's an energetic cost again. And then even the um, adults, they grow more slowly and um, uh, sort of are less productive under ocean acidification conditions. Uh, there was, there has been some good work on crabs, Dungeness crabs especially, that show that um, larval mortality increases under ocean acidification conditions um, and that they have a harder time building shells. And then the same thing for urchins. Um, they have a harder time building shells, they have a harder time maintaining their shells, and they grow more slowly. Now keep in mind that all of these, even though the photos are from field um, sites, the, the evidence come from, comes from laboratory studies, okay? We now have new evidence, and maybe some of you saw this in uh, the Seattle Times recently, um, or other news outlets, that even in the field, Crab larvae, so these are the larvae of Dungeness crabs, um, off Washington and Oregon, um, show shell damage under current conditions of ocean acidification. So you don't even have to take these, these crab larvae into the lab and essentially dose them with high CO2. You can go out on a cruise, collect them, and uh, essentially evaluate the condition of their shells and these researchers found that even under current like present day conditions of ocean acidification crab larvae have a hard time building their shells and they also interestingly enough are not building their these mechanoreceptors which are small little bits on larval shells that help um, help them sort of make their way in the world and feed themselves. Okay, so this is brand new evidence and it's, um, uh, I think it surprised many people. Interestingly enough, fish are affected and they're affected in a really different way than um, like sh those, but than oysters and mussels that are trying to maintain shell, external shells. Fish, are affected through um, their nervous system or their sensory apparatus. Pretty much, their you know uh, I guess they're called nasal rosettes. There is um, uh, uh, 
There's a negative effect of ocean acidification on a key, um, on a suite of key molecules that are um, critical to sensory perception in fish. This was first demonstrated um, on coral reefs in, in Australia. It's kind of like the Finding Nemo thing, but Nemo no longer can find where he should be. Um, there's a, a host of evidence from Australia. But people have started looking at the effects on fish here in Washington and have found that coho salmon similarly <coughs> lose their ability to smell under ocean acidification conditions. Now these, again, I'm back to lab results. We don't have field results for this yet. But what this plot shows is that um, a juvenile coho salmon put in a uh, high CO2 or low pH situation. And, you know, admittedly, this is pretty low pH, but we're getting there. <coughs> we'll, we will get to 7.2 at some point. Um, they spend as much time moving towards their predators as away from them. They don't sense their predators well enough to move away from them. Okay? That's a critical thing over, you know, a long period of time. That could lead to, you know, additional mortality. Interestingly enough, remember we talked about different taxa respond differently. Um, we tested the same thing in sablefish, so that's black cod, and they did not show the same response. So black cod didn't really show a big response to, um, to elevated CO2 or depressed pH. So, you know, that there's, if you want to take that as good news, it is good news. Not every species <coughs> shows identical negative response. Rockfish. Rockfish are really of importance um, in the Salish Sea. Uh, they're conservation targets. People used to like to eat them, and now we like to preserve them, I think. Um, <coughs> Copper rockfish also show behavioral changes under ocean acidification conditions. I mean, the first, the first <laughs> publication that came out about copper rockfish says they get edgy. That's when, well, everybody's edgy. Come on. Um, but they, they lose sensory ability again. They lose lateralization, which in a fish means the ability to swim upright instead of on their side. Right? And if you've owned an aquarium, you know that when a fish swims on its side, it's not a good thing. Um, so copper rockfish <coughs> show um, negative response under high PCO2 conditions. Um, but blue rockfish don't. Blue rockfish are kind of from a different group of rockfish, a different subgroup, and they don't show a response. So again, there's lots of variability that is... Um, it's not, it's not apparent until you look for it. Uh, it makes it hard for us because we, that means we can't generalize across all taxa. This is one of the most uh, astonishing um, findings to me, and uh, partly because <laughs> I, I, I work on algae, or I have in the past. Um, it is remarkable, and it is very well documented now, that harmful algae, those that produce toxins that harm, uh, that cause harm to humans, they grow faster and they produce more toxin per cell under ocean acidification conditions. That's remarkable. And I don't think we yet quite know <coughs> why, but it is a very general response across very different groups of, of plankton, phytoplankton, including diatoms and dinoflagellates. And for those of you that are sort of phytoplankton nerds, you know that dinoflagellates and, and diatoms are very, very different. They, they aren't similar at all, but they have the same response. Um, phytoplankton, I mean, harmful algal blooms are becoming, we know other evidence. Um, this, this evidence is from the field, uh, but we have field evidence that harmful algal blooms are becoming more intense and longer each year um, uh, along the West Coast. So that, that's um, 
uh, surprising. So a brief recap of what we know, and really this is just the tip of the iceberg, just some examples. We know that corrosive conditions already occur in the Salish Sea and throughout the Salish Sea. I gave you some evidence from the Northern Salish Sea, but there's equally good evidence from the Southern Salish Sea, especially s South Sound, South Puget Sound, and Hood Canal. Those tend to be among um, the most acidified waters in the region. <coughs> we know that the conditions are projected to worsen. It's not going to get better anytime soon. Uh, we know that there's abundant evidence for negative biological responses, and that evidence far outweighs the evidence for positive biological responses. And the evidence for positive responses, when it exists, is generally in vegetations, in vegetation, seaweeds <coughs> and phytoplankton. Um, we know that species of diverse taxa are negatively affected. Um, most big taxa uh, show species that have um, negative responses. We know that a host of life processes are negatively affected. Everything from fertilization to metamorphosis <coughs> to larval settlement and growth and survival. Um, they're all affected. Um, and we know that sensitivity and response varies by taxon, and it varies by the dose or the severity of the conditions. OK, enough, enough about that. Um, what can we do? Uh, that is a harder question to answer. Keep in mind that the pH of the ocean and the PCO2 in the ocean is directly <coughs> um, uh, uh, associated with the amount of CO2 in the air. OK, so reducing carbon emissions, I mean, that is imperative. We have to reduce carbon emissions to address this problem. We also know it's darn hard. And it's not, um, I mean, we can all do the best we can in our own lives and our own behaviors, but <coughs> very few of us have much ability to um, change sort of the global political um, scene, except, you know, through things like voting. Um, but still, we have to do this, and we can't take this off the table. We can't just assume that we can find other fixes. We have to reduce carbon emissions. But what can we do locally? That's what people want to know more about. People want to know what they can do personally or what they can do in a group setting um, and in a local setting. So there's been a lot of talk about whether eelgrass can ameliorate local ocean acidification conditions. And I know there's been work done here at Western on this. Um, Brooks Group um, <coughs> and others have looked at the effects of eelgrass on local ocean acidification conditions. The results are a little bit equivocal. Um, it turns out that site and scale and season and time of day all influence the results you get. Okay? So it's not a solid yes, it's not a solid no. Um, the folks at w the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, or sorry, <laughs> sorry, I'm very sorry about that. The Washington Department of Natural Resources um, have done some really nice field studies. So these aren't lab studies, these are field studies. And what they've shown is that eelgrass, the eelgrass, the native eelgrass, Zoster marina, can significantly increase pH in some nearshore environments. And they've, they've evaluated this, this through field sampling. They've also shown that both the Pacific oyster, which is the one that most people eat, that's not native to Puget Sound or the Salish Sea, and the Olympia oyster, which is our native oyster, they both grow faster inside eelgrass beds than outside eelgrass beds. And that implies that the seawater conditions are better inside the eelgrass beds. <coughs> 
they also w have been able to demonstrate that oysters that are living closer to eelgrass, so imagine taking a transect out of an eelgrass bed for some distance. The, oys the oysters that grow closer to eelgrass grow faster than oysters that are farther away from eelgrass. Okay, also <coughs> consistent with the idea that eelgrass is having a positive influence on water condition. But there are some contravening factors um, that uh, sort of make the question a little murkier. So first of all, we can say yes, but. There's a really low ratio of eelgrass biomass to water volume in the Salish Sea. There's not enough eelgrass in the Salish Sea to really um, affect water conditions on a big scale. Okay, maybe very locally, but once you get very far from that bed, you're not going to have a big effect, and there's not enough eelgrass around to really have the effect that, <coughs> that we might want. We also know that the distribution of eelgrass is really uneven. So Padilla Bay here, you know, here down the road, is a great example of a great eelgrass bed. But most of the eelgrass in Puget Sound, Salish Sea, is kind of scrappy. Um, it's it, dense stands of eelgrass are. Um, not the norm. Uh, there's a spatial mismatch between where eelgrass occurs and water conditions are kind of the worst. So, for example, in Hood Canal and South Puget Sound, water conditions in terms of ocean acidification are among the worst. And there's very, very little in eelgrass in that region to help. And then we also know that, you know, eelgrass, they're a plant. They respire. They, they suck down CO2. Um, while they're photosynthesizing during daylight hours, but then they release it at night, right? They respire just like animals, um, kind of like animals at night, um, and that raises the CO2 back up. And then as all that tissue that they develop <coughs> dies back in winter and kind of um, is digested by microbes, that's another pulse of CO2 into the system. So it's complicated, um, and we could do more work on this. Um, other questions. Uh, can adding vegetation or shell hash improve conditions for shellfish growth? So this was um, a project that one of my graduate students did, uh, Courtney Grainer. Uh, she added vegetation, again, because vegetation, at least during the day, sucks down or absorbs CO2 from seawater. It brings the CO2 down and the pH goes up. Um, and that's a good thing. The shell hash kind of works the other way. If you put in shell hash, the shells are kind of slowly dissolving. I'll let Brooke talk about that. <laughs> um, the shells slowly dissolve, and could some of that shell dissolution help to improve the water quality? Uh, both those things have been proposed. And could you detect an effect on very small stages of shellfish? So smaller, you know, a quarter the size of your little fingernail. Well, what she found um, in two seasons worth of field work is that there was no effect of shell hash or um, vegetation at, at the two sites she worked on at um, in Padilla Bay and then down in southern Puget Sound in the Skokomish Delta. So she was not able to detect an effect um, on the growth of young, very small stages of clams. It doesn't mean, you know, this is one study, it doesn't mean it couldn't happen, uh, but we were not able to find an effect. Another question that's been asked, and I know people, John Ripsick's group um, has been really active in this sphere here at Western, can we use aquatic vegetation to promote carbon storage? Can you lock up some of the carbon that's in seawater get it into the sediment and trap it there for a while. That would be a really good thing. Um, and people are very interested in that question. So again, some of the work that's been done locally, um, this was another one of my graduate students, Erin um, Murray, uh, and she worked with folks here at Western, um, collaborated um, folks at Western and also folks at Padilla Bay to do this work. <laughs> she looked at two sites, um, one in the Skagit River Delta and one in Padilla Bay and looked at the mean carbon density in the mudflat um, 
at sites that had vegetation, meaning seagrass, and sites that had no vegetation, meaning they were unvegetated mudflat. And she really didn't find a difference either. She certainly didn't find that vegetation did much to help store carbon in this region. And I think, and I don't know if John's in the audience, I think that's fairly consistent with some of the work that's been done here at Western. A paper was just published um, by folks up at the Hakai Institute up in British Columbia that aggregated um, um, a number of different studies from southeast Alaska down to Oregon, but including sites in the Salish Sea, and asked, uh, reported um, on the amount of carbon locked up in sediments in various habitats. And here we're looking explicitly in eelgrass meadows. Okay, so this is work that Carolyn Prentice and others did. And what you can see is that big red arrow there, that's the amount of carbon inset stored in sediments in the Salish Sea. And it's tiny compared to the fraction that is reported like for the global average, which is here. Okay. So the global average is huge and hence the interest in locking up carbon using uh, eelgrass, but it turns out in our own local environment, it doesn't seem to um, be a, an effective uh, mechanism or way to approach a problem. Okay, what about kelp? There's, you know, kelp are really attractive in this sphere to many people because, first of all, we love them. Um, they provide a lot of productive habitat for fish and other species. They grow really rapidly, um, and they produce really high biomass. Those are all really good characteristics. Um, we don't have an answer about kelp yet, but the, the sort of cons <coughs> are that kelps tend to be highly seasonal, or the biomass tends to be highly seasonal. So it would only work part of the year. <coughs> the carbon in kelps is highly labile, meaning, yeah, the kelps grow rapidly, they produce a lot, they suck up a lot of carbon, they store it in their tissues, but their kelps are notoriously leaky. They leak out a whole bunch of that carbon right into the water column while they're alive. And then when they die, it's even worse because the tissues die with them and they're consumed by <coughs> microbes that release more CO2 into the water. So that calls into, you know, that doesn't look too promising. Um, kelps in the Salish Sea are habitat limited. There's, you know, you might look at the shore and think there's a lot of kelp, but really they're habitat limited. And growing kelp, if you really want to grow it, as in farm it, it's really expensive and labor intensive. Okay, so jury's out on kelp. So where does that leave us? There's lots of variation in the physical and biological systems. There's lots of uncertainty, but I would encourage you guys to view that as opportunity, okay? Where there's uncertainty, there's opportunity. Um, in my opinion, there does not seem to be any silver bullet. Um, and I think what we need to do is think about a portfolio of remedies and use them all. Okay, so a little bit of good news before I wrap up. I think I have about five more minutes. Washington is among the most progressive states in dealing with this issue. And in fact, within the US, Washington took the earliest and strongest action to address ocean acidification, and they continue to do so. So the pictures up here are lots of different people that have been involved, um, but Suffice to say that there's been enormous leadership in Washington, and that continues today. Um, the state legislature has articulated priorities, research priorities for Washington, and they have actually put money behind these research priorities. So among them are to understand the status and trends of ocean acidification, to quantify the relative contribution of different acidifying factors. What does that mean? It means, does nitrogen make things worse? Do other sorts of pollutants make things worse? And can we measure that? Because if we can measure those things, 
then maybe we can use that as part of our portfolio of strat management strategies. Um, and then to continue to describe biological responses, like in fish and shellfish, to describe real-time corrosive seawater conditions and to develop short-term forecasts. So there's a guy, Parker McCready, one of my colleagues at UW, who has been able with a big team of people to develop forecasts and you can get them on your phone. And you know, a, a shellfish grower can look at a forecast, call up a forecast on his phone and know with pretty darn good certainty what the ocean acidification conditions are gonna be like three days from now. And that's helpful to people like oyster growers. Okay, so the actions in Washington have spurred broader initiatives. They really spurred a lot of action along the whole West Coast. So once Washington started taking action, California and Oregon really wanted to be in on this, and they've taken their own action. There are other states, Maine, Massachusetts, um, New York, especially those three have sort of emulated what's gone on in Washington or the actions Washington has taken. So what started here has sort of disseminated to other states, but then there's also been an international initiative that grew out of the work that was begun in Washington. Um, there is a group, and you can Google this, the International Alliance to Combat Ocean Acidification. It's become an international group, but it lives right here in Washington. Um, and they are, they're not a scientific group. They use science. They consult with scientists, but what they are trying to do is to advance action planning for ocean acidification around the world, to elevate ocean acidification in climate agreements, such as the Paris Climate Agreement and others, and to build a big global coalition. Okay, And this came directly out of work that Washington <coughs> began. Still, despite those you know, positive uh, outcomes, we know that the global at atmospheric CO2 levels continue to rise. We need to get this under control. Um, but if we do so, we have the ability, we have the power to choose between alternative futures, right? If we have lower CO2, so CO2 doesn't rise as quickly, we have more options to adapt and manage. The more slowly CO2 rises, or if we're really optimistic, as CO2 declines, we have more options to adapt and manage. And that is key. At higher levels of CO2 and at higher rates of increase, we diminish our options to manage CO2 in the atmosphere. So, the good news here is that we get to choose. <coughs> okay, and then finally, I'm just gonna wrap up with this. Um, a short list of practical actions to benefit the Salish Sea. These are mine, um, you can blame me. Uh, number one, reduce carbon emissions. That's essential. Uh, we can reduce co-occurring stressors. What do I mean by that? Well, nitrogen tends to be a co-occurring stressor. Low oxygen tends to be a co-occurring stressor. Other pollutants, metals and hydrocarbons also. If you imagine yourself a tiny larva already stressed energetically trying to deal with low pH, adding you know, pollutants just increases the stress level. So there are things we can do within our existing toolbox, within all the existing laws and regulations within Washington State, we don't need a new law, we don't need a new regulation. We could just observe the ones we have and you know, do good things. So we can reduce co-occurring stressors. You know, in whatever way possible, preserve ecosystem processes. Um, that might be through fisheries management, it may, may be through uh, land use management, it may be through other mechanisms, but preserve the ecosystem. <coughs> We can preserve um, existing aquatic vegetation. I am not yet among those that um, am advocating for uh, wide-scale planting of vegetation. That may come to pass, uh, and I, so I'm just holding that in abeyance. But we can do no harm by preserving what we already have. That's a great place to start. 
We can reduce disturbance to habitats that store carbon. Don't dredge up that carbon because if you, as you dredge those habitats, the carbon is re-released to the atmosphere. Leave the carbon where it is, even if it's a small amount. Um, preserve evolutionary potential. I didn't talk about this, but if you can preserve the genes that already, the diverse genetic diversity in populations, that goes a long way to promoting adaptation over the long term. And finally, for especially for the students here, um, you have to remain optimistic. And you have to work hard and study hard so you can solve the problem. <laughs> OK, so um, with that, I will um, acknowledge many of my collaborators and sponsors. And um, I think we probably have a couple minutes for questions. We actually don't. Oh. Um, we just are, are done at 520. Oh. But that's okay, because we had to go for the final messages where the <laughs> were important. So I think if folks have, if you have questions, you can come down and talk to Terry um, as, after class. But let's say thanks. Um, <laughs>